Okay, I think um, bonus DS, everyone. Um, I think let's go over the remaining part, uh, which we promised to go over. Uh, we did UV vis uh, spectroscopy, we did a Fourier transform in first spectroscopy, and another one is a Raman, which is really very, very important uh, optical spectroscopic technique. And we'll just briefly go over uh, what is the different, what the physics behind it, and how that's being used in many applications. Oh, sorry. Ouch. Okay. So, um, so just to uh, set that goal, like uh, what uh, Raman spectroscopy were behind. So we are uh, we we spoke about that UV and visible spectroscopy, we try to measure the electronic transition um, of the material. But in Raman, uh, like infrared spectroscopy, you will be looking for low energy modes, uh, mostly vibrational and rotational modes. And we'll talk about how that differs with uh, infrared, sp normal infrared spectroscopy, which we spoke about. So again, we are behind uh, vibrational, rotational modes uh, like we did in infrared spectroscopy. Uh, so again, it's very commonly used in chemistry uh, to provide fingerprint of molecules, basically mo many, many molecules. Almost each molecule has their unique vibrational um, um, resonances and can be uh, measured or characterized using um, our, our Raman spectroscopy. Uh, so it's kind of a complementary to IR spectroscopy. So many times uh, you can do uh, infrared spectroscopy and Raman interchangeably, uh, but that we'll talk about why that is little unique compared to this. So it has least unique characteristics we'll talk about in a minute. And it kind of creates um, many times very unique fingerprints. And then we'll try to compare Raman with infrared spectroscopy, which we did uh, yesterday. Again, it's kind of a historical uh, development. And uh, fortunately, it was developed in my city where I was born in Calcutta, India. So um, it's kind of um, a good optics uh, center. So the Raman, uh, uh, maybe a few hundred, few, I don't know, maybe 60, 70 miles away from my location. So there, the famous institute called Presidency College where he was looking for various uh, organic liquids and tried to, he started looking at various um, peaks of light which couldn't be explained uh, using normal um, uh, infrared, normal UV spectroscopy. That time they didn't have FTIR, but uh, that, that era he could only see very weak energy lines appearing in the spectrum. There was no laser that time, so that time they used to um, uh, um, like arc bulb, a mercury arc bulb, um, that was the kind of things to do. You create a flash of light and then you photographic plate. This is simply a photographic plate uh, and then he was studying benzene. So send a flash of light through a benzene and he started seeing those lines. You develop, in normal photographic plate, camera plate, you just put the photographic plate, whatever light comes through the benzene, uh, you just create those lines. Uh, and then, um, and then, uh, and then he was analyzing the, those lines based on the wavelengths so, and energy, and they were not matching with the uh, uh, normal known UV or visible spectroscopy around that time. That how that those lines um, appear in the spectrum. So that's kind of started that Raman scattering, that lights being scattered at due to the vibration of the molecule, not just electronic absorption. So I think just to set that tone right, that we gone through the infrared uh, spectroscopy quite in depth uh, last two days, uh, saw many examples how that can be exploited and it's kind of really spreading across the industry using infra infrared spectroscopy, it's very cheap you, and we'll talk about that very comparatively easy. But this is very unique too, that, so just to compare a point by point, that is a scattering, uh, so this, in Raman spectroscopy, uh, light getting scattered due to the vibration of molecules. So basically it is mostly 
basically scattered photons from the vibrating molecule and, and absorption part is weak. But here mostly uh, the vibrating molecules absorb the infrared radiation that's kind of and then this is infrared again we have to kind of we will make sure this is typically excited with visible kind of light means high energy photons. So, uh, so we will we'll, we'll go in a minute with a nice picture to talk about it. So, here process is more of a scattering of the photon bouncing off of a vibrating molecule. In, in infrared you give a weak photon so that they get absorbed. So just to be, even if you don't listen anything, if somebody asks you what is the difference between a um, Raman spectroscopy or infrared spectroscopy, the, the, the most important um, uh, point here is that we will be exciting with a high energy photon like a normal UVV uh, spectroscopy. Uh, but now that light, which is a, in this case we will be using a laser, so that light it only bounces back like a scattered from this vibrating molecule. A mo again, we have a picture to show the molecule vibrates and the light gets scattered back, does not get absorbed because energy is much stronger than the molecular absorption. And here you give enough energy that, that get completely weak photon, this infrared light weak photon, this is more a visible light, high energy photons, the weak photon you give that vibration actually absorb that energy and you basically measure absorption spectra compared to this one the scattering spectra. That is the main um, uh, difference. And then uh, just to continue that the vibration in um, Raman active if it is causes some polarizability and you will talk about that means we are changing polarizability of the uh, molecule um, um, and in, in, in contrast infrared we are changing the dipole moments again we will come back to that. Uh, so again not necessarily the molecule need to have a permanent dipole moment means uh, you do not need to have a like a di dipole moment present in the molecule to be measured through Raman because they are simply bouncing of the photon out of the um, uh, or from the molecule so you do not need to have a permanent dipole moment. Um, so here is basically vibration concern should change the dipole moment. Here we are changing the dipole moment that is how the energy getting absorbed. Here we are not um, uh, uh, get energy getting absorbed uh, to some extent. We will talk about the difference in a minute but it is mostly scattering process. So dipole moment not necessarily means the molecule not necessarily has to be polar molecule. Here it necessary to have some kind of polarity means you need to change the dipole moment. And this is a nice and I think that brings um, and uh, back to my interest that so we are talking about measuring uh, mercury from water that is a good point and we will show some example that water can be used in a Raman spectroscopy. So water does not play big role and we will talk about but in infrared water um, because light has to go through and if water spectrum matches with your molecule which, which is suspending or dissolved in the water then you will not see that spectrum it light will be completely absorbed because you are you are just measuring absorption right. So, uh, if if water itself has a big um, absorption spectrum in the so you think about what this is a water absorption spectrum I'm not putting any, putting any mark and then in a you know in the molecule which is sus uh, in the water also has some features say has absorption here absorption here you, you are behind those guys but you will not be able to say it because light cannot penetrate because your goal is to have a cuvette with a water in it and then your molecules are floating right and then you are sending your IR radiation and measuring here. So these peaks will not appear because light get absorbed in the water. So that is a problem uh, using um, infrared spectroscopy and water many times um, kind of spoils the measurement. So typically in Raman we are uh, measuring the covalent character of the molecule again we will talk about we are actually probing the bond stretching and rotation of the bond and that is how electron the light uh, scattered um, and then here we are actually changing the dipole moment. So again we will talk about in a minute we are actually measuring the ionic character means how the molecules are how polar how the charges are separated because you are dipole right. So charge needs to move around so we are kind of measuring ionic character of the molecule. So, this is uh, again the part uh, uh, Raman spectrum because typically you will be using a laser so it's kind of um, uh, instruments are relatively expensive compared to infrared where simply using a light bulb 
as a source. So your source could be a light bulb. Here you need a uh, laser to excite. So it's kind of relatively expensive. So that's kind of separate these two that the main, these are kind of uh, smaller separation. I think cost is not something scientifically we should, we are worried about. I think the other point is that we are measuring absorption versus scattering. That is a two major uh, difference of um, uh, uh, principle of work in Raman versus uh, infrared spectroscopy. So again, just to, in general, that if we put a material uh, or a molecule in, in front of a light, these are the thing happens that light can be, in a, in a macroscopic level, you can measure its transmission, reflection, absorption, luminescence, uh, all of those uh, light does through the molecule or the material. But in a, in a, you know, any, a, at a molecular level, actually a photon does two things. It scatter, um, elastic scattering or inelastic scattering, and that's what we'll talk about. So that's what it happens uh, when you put a molecule. Um, 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 so the, those are the phenomena that takes place. So that's kind of nice to understand that uh, for a uh, for a uh, for a principle like we have those vibrational modes. So those are not energy band diagram. This is not energy band gap. This is we are just plotting vibrational modes uh, of those molecules. They're all stretching and bending. So this is a molecule and it's just stretching and bending all the time. So now I'm exciting with a high energy photon. That's my incidence green light. Typically. 514, this is the laser I'm using. This is very common uh, Raman excitation, that exact same laser I'm using. That, that is a very common uh, Raman excitation, 514.5 nanometer laser. You are exciting a molecule, and now a little portion, because the molecule is stretching and vibrating, so some will get, um, um, some will get um, absorbed, and remaining just scattered back. So we are just um, we are we are doing a molecule, just a very simple molecule uh, A, B, B. So now it is already is it is it is vibrating. Say for instance, in a very simple like a harmonic motion is vibrating. Now I'm bringing a, a photons with some energy H nu. So now, now the photon actually key, um, uh, oscillates charges because the electron clouds with the covalent bonding, right? If you think about the covalent bonding, so the charges are present uh, all across. So when light comes in, it changes the polarizability, means your P equal to alpha E, right? That's my polarizability. So as electric field, so light has electric field. So the, that's my electric field of the light. Um, that actually changes the charge distribution. So, and that charge distribution oscillates because this is a light field, so it is actually oscillating field. So you're changing the oscillation. So now, once you do so, so now the three things can happen that now you make the charge oscillate at same frequency of the light. So this is my H nu oscillating at frequency F. You re-radiate back, either you re-radiate back at the same frequency same frequency, you, uh, so that's a re-radiation back, you can send back, you can, you can do the other one, plus delta F, higher frequency, or minus delta F. And we'll talk about what these two, three things mix. So what is the bottom line, if we have to take home, uh, come, uh, message is that we have a molecule uh, which has a vibrational energy that always, um, uh, just simple picture, it could have a rotational energy too it can rotate, but now it is a mechanical movement and they have a charge distribution because of the covalent bonding and they come with electric field. So electric field will drive that charge, right? And at resonance, at, at a point where the charge oscillation length and frequency matches the, your electric field, which is a AC field uh, of your light field, matches that resonance, then you actually re-radiate. So this photon get absorbed by this uh, dipole um, and then uh, we, can, we can write this dipole moment uh, as my charge separation Q times the distance D. Like that's my uh, dipole moment. So I'm driving the process, my polarizability is this. So based on my electric field, which is my light field, I'm making this material polarized, means my, my charges are swinging across the bonds. So now, 
Now the re-radiated photon can have this same frequency, little higher frequency, a lower frequency. And you can actually imagine that thing very easily by looking at a billiard table. When you have a billiard table, this is your billiard ball, and you are coming with a, your red striker, and you hit that. So now you scatter it back, it goes, your, this guy can go to this with the same velocity, it can come with the same velocity, uh, it can get the energy transfer completely, your same velocity but different angle. Or you can have a velocity which is less than, than V0 or can happen that you can go more than V0. In this case, for a billiard ball, it, you cannot go more than V0 because this is static. But in, the, in case this is also moving, then some of the energy can transfer back from here to here or vice versa, depending on which one you are tracking. So the vibration, you can now imagine that the vibration of the molecule gives some energy back to the scattered photon. So light scattered back uh, due to this radiation process. So now, if we go to a little more realistic picture, that's what it happens. Now, you excite with a high energy photon, uh, in this case, um, a, typically a visible light uh, photon, and then you can actually re-radiate that photon exactly called elastic scattering. No loss of energy. Elastic scattering only changes the angle, right? That's our basic mechanics, that we change the angle, but your elastic scattering is your excitation is same as re-emission, and you can see that my uh, excitation E equal to my re-emitted photon. That's my Rayleigh scattering. I mean, that's what the, you, nothing happens. You give green light, green light comes out, out of the system, it's scattered, comes back. That's my predominant phenomena. But now you can also have a situation where your frequency, you re-radiate, so you excite with a photon, which is that um, H nu naught, but you re-radiate with lesser frequency, it means your some of the energy getting absorbed by this vibrating molecule. The bonds actually took some energy out of the photon and re-radiate. So that means now for a more of for physical motion, think about, means your, your, this frequency of oscillation of charges which is my, I wrote uh, this one, is weaker compared to which your, your oscillating driving force oscillating at much faster than your, your phase lag, means your charge cannot follow that fast speed of change. So it is re-radiating, the dipole is re-radiating a wavelength uh, which is uh, lowered in frequency. That's what um, we have this talks. Uh, we call it just invention by Stokes, so it's called Stokes scattering. And you can also have anti-Stoke where you give some energy back because you are vibrating, because molecules are vibrating and, and your oscillator uh, on the charge are oscillating. So you give some energy back from the mechanical vibration back to your light field vibra vibration, which is the, my original excitation field, which is my this. So you give a extra energy. So you create a photon with higher frequency or um, uh, lower lambda. So that's my anti-Stokes uh, phenomenon. So that's something nicely captured here that you excite with your, um, your laser and you create two type of photon comes out. One is Stokes, which is a shorter, a lower in frequency or lower in energy and one called anti-Stokes, which is higher in frequency. Kind of makes sense. So that's, some, that's what we're kind of doing in the Raman, but now one thing subtlety you can, can can start seeing that we are only exciting with a one single wavelength of light and you can create many. This is simply an example, but you can have many Stokes mode and many anti-Stokes mode because of the fact, because now your this motion, this harmonic, mechanical harmonic motion has not only a fundamental mode, but it can have many higher order modes. Now, if you think about, if you plot them, the mechanics, mechanical um, uh, breathing or breathing modes means if you just plot these guys' oscillation, the simple picture, it may not be just simple sinusoid, not just a fundamental harmonic motion. It can be very complex harmonic motion, right? It can have a very complex motion. So it is not only creating uh, bouncing up, so your H nu comes on, so this oscillation may not be only one mode, could oscillate in which for more fundamental, more higher order modes. So it will create 
your F1, F2, F3, F4, so on and so forth. So it will create more photons. So you are actually creating light because of this mechanical vibration of the molecule. So you will have, and you will see the spectrum that now I'm trying to kind of mentally guiding you that in an infrared spectroscopy for the high school guys uh, understanding, you can teach them that for the infrared spectroscopy, you have a material and you have to send infrared light of all the possible lambda, lambda 3, lambda n, each lines you send them back. And you just measure how many and how much each of them are absorbed and you plot lambda versus absorption plot, which something look like that. But you have to send each individual wavelength through your sample. But here, we're not doing that. We're just giving like one wavelength, which is a, my excitation light, which is a narrow laser line, a 540 nanometer with few nanometer line widths. We're just exciting with one line. And let the system generate those photons. Because it is a, a dipolar moment, like that's how any time a charge or oscillation happens, you generate a photons. That's how antenna works, that's how phone works, right? Electron comes in. Waves comes from the outside, drives a, um, a motion of electron on my patch antenna here, you create current. Or opposite, my signal is going back, I'm driving a current through a little patch antenna, it creates uh, yeah, a, um, a radio frequency photon which propagates out. Same thing happening, you are now creating this complex harmonic motion like this uh, that you re-radiate multiple wavelengths, a broadband uh, a light generates and that could be and now that could be have a lower energy. Um, uh, it could have a lower energy um, like that called Stokes or it could be higher energy based on the scattering process. Like if the scattering, it has to be in, a, in a elastic cost scattering. If it's elastic scattering, then you get back same thing. I mean some photon will come back at same wavelength, which is 514. That is elastic scattering, like a billiard ball. You hit exact same speed, you get it ex all that char velocity transfer back to through the elastic bouncing process, no energy loss. Then you will get back exactly your excitation back. But that is not something interesting. We are not behind that. We want inelastic. That's what I think we kind of do. A small portion is inelastically scattering. I mean, a small portion of energy you excite, we want it to get transferred to this charge oscillation process so that I get my, some will not be scattered, like a Rayleigh scattering means some comes back as it is, but I want a stock shifted one, a frequency which is not little higher or little lower uh, than my excitation. Always. But there are, now question is, uh, typically what people do that, um, uh, good question you raised. So one uh, is that typically most Raman cases, you have one source, you create whatever spectrum. But you can imagine with one source, you cannot excite all the vibrational modes. So typically people keep more lines. So very popular is a 514 green and 785 near infrared light. These two actually near, that covers uh, quite wide range of uh, vibrations. Temperature. Yeah. Oh, sure. So if you can sure. 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 Right. So as he's men mentioning that the vibration depends on uh, temperature. So the spectrum is a temperature dependent. So basically, if you want a ground state, room temperature, high energy, so you have to re-measure everything again. Your spectrum will change uh, based on the temperature. For sure, this is very much a temperature dependent phenomena. But yes, uh, in principle, you can keep many lines. So typically, I saw two prominent Raman excitation, uh, uh, 514 and um, uh, 785 to capture most of the vibrational mode. But in principle, you can have infinite number of sources uh, because still white light LED uh, lasers are not very popular, not being there, super continuum lasers. So, but again, that could be like, but then the problem interpretation get difficult because the vibration and module on top of each other. Now you are very, I will show you in a minute that how the spectrum looks much cleaner uh, versus if you have more sources. Again, so we'll come back to that point again, but the point we're kind of trying to say that we excite with a thing and, and the system generates these modes. So these lights kind of system generates. Now what is telling us? 
It is giving a molecular information because now this peaks, it is not my light. I, hasn't, I haven't sent it infrared, all is my light. I send it back. Whether I measure one by one with UVVs or I do Fourier transform through uh, autocorrelation that we spoke about the math behind that, that we regain it back. But bottom line, we have to give all the lines. We have to excite the sample with lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3 to lambda infinite and plot as a lambda versus amplitude uh, absorption. But here, I'm doing channel sounding, like a, a communication people for wireless. Uh, I'm not a communication guy, but um, like a general uh, electronics background. So we do channel sounding, you send a pulse and then and look for the reflected path from there, you estimate multipath and you can take your um, 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 signal and correlate the multipath. So that's what I'm doing, you channel sounding, you send one light and look for all the other modes you are getting back out of it. And, and in general, you can imagine the probability of emission uh, is Rayleigh scattering is the maximum light will come scatter, elastic scattering. And then will be some stokes, means they will lose energy. And then much less will be anti-stokes where it gain energy. It kind of makes sense, right? To gaining energy back from a system, probability goes down. You always lose energy. Only when you get lottery, you get money, right? Most cases you spend. That's kind of, so lottery is less, just a realistic example. So here, your, your photon actually getting extra energy from your mechanical vibration. So you are vibrating such a way that your, your dipole is oscillating, right? So that oscillation getting some extra energy and it, it is generating a frequency is much higher than, means your charge is oscillating faster than your field oscillation. That for a very, for very much of a uh, uh, physical picture is that the charge oscillation has to be faster than your field. That is a light field oscillation, which is oscillating with the frequency of f. So you have to have a delta f. This guy has to oscillate faster than the driven one, and that is very less likely. Maybe some configuration of atom where charges kind of go shorter distance. You can imagine that if the molecules is strong longer, that's never going to have anti-stoke. The bottom line will be molecular bonds has to be shorter because charge can only go sh short distance and then come back. So it can f move faster. For a longer bonding, it cannot um, cover that distance with that frequency. So one thumb rule will be that molecular bonds that will be shorter length, then they have a chance of, uh, of uh, oscillating faster than the excitation uh, field. So it can faster uh, oscillation can generate a photon with anti-stokes, means with a higher frequency. That's kind of more a physical picture. Uh, uh, kind of, again, Raman is a very complicated process. And honestly, after reading so much time and myself, uh, in 2011, I had a nice paper in Nature Communication on uh, some plasma on enhanced Raman measurement. Uh, I could actually show that we can suppress some of the Stokes and anti-Stokes mode. Uh, so I was reading myself too much, but I realized that time that even Raman didn't really understood the process. Even still now, the energy transfer between molecules are not very, very well understood. It is kind of still a, um, a physical interpretation, not come, not very much of a um, done process because you were, t were exciting with a uh, uh, visible light across a band gap and then look looking for vibrational modes on the top. So basically many times vibrational mode, they call rovibonic, means you have a, uh, across the, main, you are excited, electronic, vibration, rotation, all mixed together. So those modes actually, some of them are very complex mode, and some of the energy, not just vibrational energy, they could be get absorbed as electronic transition. So, uh, so again, that's a completely different uh, research direction and uh, takes us to a wrong path, but I think for our case that a physical picture we're exciting a um, molecule which is vibrating with the excitation laser and, and we're driving a dipole making it polarized uh, and because of the motion you would recreate uh, other photons either shorter wavelength or, um, or higher wavelength. So that's Stokes and anti-Stokes. Right. In this way, I, I hope that the intensity of the um, spectrum is, is low. 
right? I think we will be not looking at the intensity, make not too much of a big thing. I think our goal will be the, the whether I can generate that stocks or anti stocks. Uh, and because the intensity will come from how many molecules you have, because you will average over many molecules. So that will defined by the density of your molecule, the intensity, the y axis. But whether this x axis has a presence, that is de determined by the, the bond length and the bond characteristics. Right, multiple number of scatter, right. So we could actually now, the key point that we could generate those uh, modes just based on one. So that is the main difference between a infrared spectroscopy that we just send a pure tone, one line, and recreate other uh, 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 wavelengths. So again, just to summarize to uh, that we, I was going through again and again that oscillating electric field component of electromagnetic radiation brings about an induced dipole in the molecule. That's what I'm mentioning. And that is modulated by the molecular vibration. So when you have induced uh, dipole, and dipole always re-radiates, right? That is the basis of the universe. Universe somehow, uh, every time you send a current, um, that's our small dipole antenna. Uh, works like you have a type piece of metal you send a current through it I and it, it re-radiates that's my basic antenna theory right that's it re-radiates the uh, uh, so anytime charge oscillation happens you re-radiate um, and that's what it is but now you think about that you when it's re-radiating this H news but your antenna is not fixed it is vibrating so it is itself length is changing now if you think about you know that from like about basic um, antenna theory, that is a condition, right? A dipole antenna emits photon based on lambda by two. So that's when you have a resonating antenna, you re very easy to find out antenna wavelength. If you know the length of the metal piece, you can find out the um, uh, emission wavelength from basic antenna theory. So now if you think about, you're, you're modulating this L dynamically. So each time you L is, you are, you are doing this, you are, you are piano accordion, you are moving this length. So what is doing? You, are do, you will generate a bunch of lambda. That's what you are doing here. Just a simple physical picture that we are re-radiating through that process. And, and because of the vibration, the L is not constant. So what I'm saying that from a very simple electrical engineering picture, which I think we are all got used to, that this antenna is not a static antenna because my length is constantly changing. So I create many wavelength. Uh, so that's what kind of summarizes that oscillation at the external field frequency are therefore observed along with beat frequencies. I was mentioning that we'll see oscillation at external uh, frequency, which is the, my driving frequency, F, I wrote. And plus, we'll also see the beat frequencies. Those are F plus delta F and F minus delta F. So we'll create all this photon I was just mentioning. That's the kind of nutshell capture that thing. So that's kind of a shows that these are the various bending, stretching, um, vibration, and rotational uh, motion will generate various stokes and um, anti-stokes uh, thing. But now you can also see an interesting aspect of that. This vibration and rotation is a very angle dependent phenomena. So I'm saying that you not only monitor one polarization because your light will be polarized in many different directions. So in a Raman, you also have to measure the um, scattered photon as a function of polarization. So use a polarizer to capture because uh, this, is all, this is already rotating. So each motion, it will create a uh, photon coming with different polarization because you because at because when your incident photon he impinges on it based on its present location, it will generate another photon. But next one will be little shifted. So you create a photon which is, which is polarization dependent. So I'm saying that for Raman, uh, monitoring the polarization also tells you the the orientation and the. Uh, and the uh, orientation of the vibration, the, the, the symmetry of the vibration. So basically saying that it is a molecular symmetry of Raman activity. You can actually find out not just by measuring the, the intensity of the uh, scattered photon, but also the polarization. Uh, so actually that is kind of um, 
uh, gives you, so again, you, you can find out the rotational and the stretching vibrating movement just by analyzing those photons polarization. So that's, that's the kind of summary. So it's kind of an interesting point, right? So we sometimes uh, just get the Raman spectrum. Typically, you all deal with this kind of spectrum. But I'm saying this spectrum is temperature dependent, as you mentioned, but vibration, rotation, changes temperature. This is for T equal to T1, most likely room temperature. And this is for the one given polarization. So you're at PS. So this is for S polarized. You're just measuring S polarized spectrum. P polarized could be something different. Maybe at P, -p, -p polarized, anti Stokes mode cannot be excited because of the orientation of the bond that that polarized light not coming. You're only generating photons which are only polarized in the S polarized direction. So I'm saying that uh, kind of molecular orientation information can be find, found out from measuring uh, Raman's um, as a function of polarization. So basically each mode is separated according to a symmetry. So you can actually find out the symmetry of those molecule vibration. Again, this is very, just to copy it actually, just to show that uh, these kind of historically people measured those spectral shifts, these stock shifts. With respect to the um, with respect to the um, the excitation, uh, so that's kind of chemist guy use heavily at the beginning. So it's kind of chemist notation. So they use web number instead of web length, which optics guy and I myself sometimes get annoyed a little bit because you know we always use web name name. But this they use one by lambda. The shift they measure one by lambda. That's the excitation minus one by lambda one. So one by lambda not your excitation and one by lam lambda one is your shift. So they measure inverse of them and they subtract. That's your shift. So they uh, report everything back into inverse centimeter. So that's, uh, yeah, now you can, you can imagine you're going from nanometer to centimeter, so you have to have a scale factor of 10 to the power seven. So that is the scaling uh, we are looking at. So you, if you take your excitation 514, your uh, shifted wavelength in nanometer, maybe 940, something like that, and then you multiply by 10 to the power seven, to convert nanometer to centimeter, you get about two or 3,000 inverse centimeter shift. So they always report the spectral shift, uh, the, the Stokes or anti-Stokes or lumbers um, uh, as a uh, inverse centimeter. Because there's sim simply a notation that instead of doing lambda one, uh, lambda one minus lambda naught, they do inverse um, uh, one by lambda chemist. Um, because they you can actually add them up actually you can directly add them up uh, one shift with the other and then use this basic mathematics just basic rule to find out what is the shifted frequency is so to what we need uh, uh, to do all of those things uh, typically you need a laser source because that's your you need a high energy um, Again, not only high energy, you, we, as was mentioning, we want to study the polarization state of the scattered photons. So you need to, a normal incoherent source typically don't maintain polarization state very well. They're not very collimated. Uh, so laser gives you all of those advantage, very narrow line width, because you know, you can imagine now going back, if you have a broadband source, you create so many modes because you will excite many, many modes because your excitation is too much. Now you have a spectrum of, very difficult to um, decipher. Your goal is to find out each Stokes and anti-Stokes to relate with one type of vibrational mode. This is one mode, could be another mode, another mode. So you can actually find out a different kind of motion of the bonding motion. But if you excite with a broadband source, you have very complex spectrum because now your bonds will try to follow that complex excitation. So that makes your, um, spectrum very very difficult so typically a narrow line with laser and that's the same com reason we do channel sounding with pulse right if for electrical engineering you know that when people design the wireless channel the tower they at the beginning they go to say pub, uh, a little higher mountain and they send a high energy pulse short pulse and and look for the echoes they wait because this is a mountain area there will be many many multipath so they look for echo and they only send a very short pulse because if you send a big 
uh, high energy pass, wide frequency range, then your echo will be very complex echo coming back, which is very difficult to deconvolute. So you send a short laser line, uh, and then you need a spectrometer because we'll be measuring wavelengths, right? So very simple setup uh, in, in, in principle. You have a laser coming through a beam splitter uh, to objective lens to your sample, and light, whatever light you generate, you come back, but key point here is that you have to put a notch filter to get out of this laser line because you don't want excitation laser on the spectrum because that is not what you want. You are, you are, look, you are looking for how many photon or mode I excited, how many photon I generated here due to or scattered here. That I want. I don't want my excitation laser mask it because this energy will be tremendous because if you have that one, you will be really scattering huge portion of light again. That's uh, I was kind of mentioning that here. Rayleigh scattering is the most predominant phenomena. Maybe 98 percent will be Rayleigh scattered, and remaining stocks and this will be maybe 10 to the power minus 5 probability, and that may be 1 percent probability. So you have a, such a small peaks, and this will be huge giant sitting. So you don't want spectrometer to see that giant excitation speak. So you basically notch filter, notch it out. You get out of this laser line, and now spectrum. Good. And now spectrometer, we've gone through that process uh, last couple of days that light comes back uh, and uh, now you, you have to separate them in wavelength. So you typically what you do, send through a grating. Uh, so you send through a grating or prism, typically a grating is more compact than prism and you separate them in wavelength and you measure through a detector. So then, now you plot wavelength versus um, uh, because you have all the light coming through, so you are measuring, so you have to disperse them. So that's a dispersive base. Uh, again, we'll talk about that people also have Fourier transform Raman spectrum. So this is simply you can do a Fourier transform, same principle, whatever light comes back, you do a Fourier transform, we'll come back in a minute. But that's the basic one, whatever light you generate, the scattered photon, you send it back, that's your filter, so you, laser comes in, excite your sample and you have a now a remaining portion of scattered excitation as well as the stokes and anti-stokes photon you generate all comes through the notch filter removes the excitation so that you are now you can have a very efficient all the stokes and anti-stokes modes comes through and then disperse through the grating with different angle and you take a, a focusing objective or focusing lens to focus them at different locations so you know which one is which color so you plot wavelength versus intensity. That's how you do a simple Raman spectroscopy. Just to give an, an example, uh, there are typical sources are, uh, uh, that's kind of, yeah, 5, 488 is used to be before the semiconductor lasers came, argon ion laser, that's, uh, I don't think people use too much because of the huge argon ion thing now, uh, um, four, uh, 514, like this, I think this is uh, 530 actually, not 514. Uh, so kind of around green laser is very popular, but you can now there are semiconductor green lasers are used. Uh, but then again, a the, uh, lot of helium red laser you can use. This is the second most used laser is 785 is a semiconductor diode laser. The 785 and 514, these are the two common Raman lines. And sometimes I saw uh, YAG also, uh, uh, one micron. Those are the kind of, but argon ion, krypton ion, those are big old kind of 1980s laser, they are not used. Helium, um, and like even helium neon also don't use, people use solid state red laser. Typically uh, 785 and 514 and sometimes 1 micron, those are the laser. So again, you can do liquid, uh, solid sample, gas sample, just need to have a cuvette or a gas chamber and do the same thing. Spectrometer, again, that's a good point. Spectrometer could be the basic one, like a dispersive one, just I was mentioning uh, dispersion based, the one we talked about few times last two days. But then the more advanced one, this Fourier transform one, you can actually have a Fourier and transform uh, spectrometer, which we've gone through last two days to do that again. So this is something look like in my labs, kind of that's a uh, uh, Raman spectrometer with the laser and all the optics house. So this is, I think Anna was asking me about the FTIR, which we covered previous days, which I did. This is my lab, actually, um, FTIR. So it is actually has a uh, microscope coupled, means you can have a sample and you can actually send the light and measure the reflection. And this is a Fourier transform FTIR. And this is the microscope. They call microscope coupled FTIR. So advantage is that you can probe very small area because it comes through an objective lens. 
and uh, it's not cheap, about 300K, $300,000 worth. So, but it really helped us to go from UV to all the way to uh, 20 micron, uh, which I was kind of mentioned throughout. So that's kind of a nice tool to have. Uh, but again, there are many cheaper versions with some less functionality can be acquired. So now, this I think we saw before and we spec, uh, spent time on uh, Fourier transform spectroscopy, but uh, there are good tools who does this Fourier transform Raman spectroscopy. So what is difference? Difference in, instead of sending a broadband infrared light, you just excite with a narrow laser light. So again, narrow laser light, excite the, uh, uh, your sample here and you whatever stokes and anti-stokes uh, signal you collect, you split it into two paths. We, we saw that, right? You Now you split it into two paths and, and one is a moving mirror, one is a fixed mirror and eventually uh, it comes to a detector. So you actually sending back the uh, interferogram which we uh, saw and gone through the math before that you instead of directly dispersing because you excite the, your sample with a laser light you create all these different wavelengths but I have no way to know what wavelength I am looking at that is the basis of the Fourier transformation right you, you send half of them to a fixed mirror send half of them to a moving mirror which is changed as a function of position uh, and then you com recombine that beam back to the detector directly. The detector sees both 50% coming from this path, 50% coming from that path, which we did before. So now you auto correlate on the detector. Detector actually sum them up uh, as a function of phase. So you may, so pro good problem is that you have to scan it. So you excite with the laser and keep scanning. Your, you move this mirror with uh, some finite steps so that you have a now many uh, phase dependent or distance dependent uh, interferogram, which we did at day one and you create a Fourier transform Raman spectroscopy. It's very advanced. This is really the gem. So you excite with a, so that I, I don't have myself that this is something more advanced where you can combine a Raman with Fourier transform spectroscopy. So you get very high quality, uh, less noise signal um, uh, in this Fourier transform based one. So now um, uh, moving uh, forward. Uh, just to show this, the uniqueness about that thing. So this is a uh, ethanol with 50% uh, uh, um, uh, water in it, 20% water in it, and this is just simple water, no ethanol. And you can see, we, let's start from the bottom. This is a Raman spectrum of, of water. So this is the, the Raman peak we are looking at of water, uh, around 3,000 inverse centimeter, the web number. And you can see that Raman, that, that didn't really affect my actual ethanol peak. I can take pick out the ethanol, but that is uh, water peak is kind of there. I can see so, but you can pick out the, um, the, the ethanol peak because of the narrowness. That's the advantage. You can create very narrow peaks because those are pure oscillation of those modes we talked about, the stretching and bending modes. Uh, you re-radiate photon are the very fundamental modes. So you can create those modes at a very nice narrow bands and then you can actually even water doesn't do much uh, in it. So this is a classic, uh, we deal, dealt with it all the time and again I think we gone through that yesterday due to my infrared detector development little talk which I will conclude today. That this is a graphene actually. So this is a graphene you are exciting with a 514 uh, nanometer laser and these are the graphene vibrational modes. So, so this is the mode called 2D peak. Uh, these are the defect modes uh, on the graphene. So more defects you have, this D start climbing up and up. So, and, and also this is a G mode. So, so basically a monolayer, people tabulated that a monolayer graphene should be 2D to G ratio should be more than two. So basically this should be double the intensity of that. That's a monolayer. So more layer you add, that ratio goes down. Your G peak started to go higher and higher. So that's how you can characterize a thickness of a molecule, in this case a two-dimensional material like a graphene. So that's a very unique fingerprint. So each time you grow your graphene, you actually do a Raman spectroscopy to find those vibrational modes. And, 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 and infrared spectroscopy, you know, just to show what it looked like, uh, probably I should have somewhere in my slide, we'll catch back, but uh, just to show um, what a that normal spectroscopy will fail completely just to give you that thing. So if you take a graphene, your monolayer graphene, and you send a light, you can go from all the way to UV, to visible, to uh, IR, to 
as much you can go and you plot lambda versus say absorption you will see it look like this throughout from say 300 nanometer to say 100 micron no spectral features at all because it's only mono layer it doesn't really absorb anything it is a semi metal is band gap like it has no band gap so basically it, 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 it simply sees no light it absorbs very little light based on this uh, wherever you land on your on your uh, Dirac cone so you can absorb some little intraband transition so that is what it is which is typically less than two percent so basically two less than two percent so I kind of looking at less than two percent absorption all across no features so you cannot find any information in the infrared spectroscopy any any spectroscopy uh, using optics but this is has well, now this is a different question we are talking about now we have a honeycomb lattice because if you see graphene is a hexagonal lattice right uh, a graphene is like a hexagonal like this so now all the carbon atoms are sitting here. They're simply carbon, right? This is simply covalent bond carbon. So this is all carbon. So now, so each bond actually stretches and bends all the time, and you create those modes. And it creates, so that, that doesn't depend on this absolute absorption. Here, simply are going by electronic or, or vibration. So this is electronic UVVs. This is vibrational absorption. So absorption always depends on thickness, right? Beard Lambert law. Go back. It depends on this epsilon CL. L is your thickness, right? Concentration is this. So this is thickness. Concentration is constant. I cannot change carbon um, uh, packing anymore with the graphene. So this is my thickness. Monolayer has a constant thickness. So I cannot add any information more than whatever one atom gives me. But here, they are not dependent on thickness. You are just scattering photon out because of the vibration. That's a nice way of kind of isolating mentally what is the difference between a, a other optical spectroscopy versus Raman spectroscopy. So you can actually create this nice uh, vibration modes signature. So you create a very nice spectral um, uh, distribution of information and you can called unique so basically each time you grow a graphene you, you the peak will appear exactly same spot if it is graphene if you create something else then you will see peak shifts and some other peak will come come up so that is nice way of characterizing the material using uh, graphene so because these are the wavelength you didn't give it to the material material scattered those or generated those modes based on its oscillation so this is about inverse so you excite with somewhere here 514 so 200 and uh, 2500 inverse centimeter roughly will be around 900 nanometer so looking at this is a 900 800 nanometers this is a visible wavelength range you can use silicon detector to measure all of those so now there are m many different kinds of um, raman uh, spectroscopy uh, people use kind of resonance raman spectroscopy um, uh, like a, again similar but you look for put your material on top of a resonating surface like a surface plasma enhanced Raman spectroscopy you can think that one uh, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy means um, you can actually do SARS um, like SARS is a what I did like in my postdoc work so SARS means you can create some say metallic pattern say metallic pattern when you excite with light you create strong electromagnetic field on those metal due to surface plasma on. and what you do you coat your sample with your molecule which you want to characterize now you excite with your laser now your mit your molecules see much stronger light field because of the presence of um, uh, the excitation of surface plasma on. so that is called surface enhanced Raman scattering and that's what we could show that uh, your Raman scatter the Stokes signal with and without the substrate we call this surface if you remove this metal surface and just measure the normal molecule uh, your Stokes will be this is excitation you could go at least maybe 10 times to people people uh, I when I was reporting I was mentioning about 10 to the power 6 enhancement compared to with and without that surface. Because of the presence of electric field, uh, you can actually enhance the Raman signal um, uh, tremendously. 
uh, micro Raman uh, spectroscopy for smaller material sample. People do non-linear Raman spectroscopic technique. You you don't excite with the fundamental laser light, but through a non-linear process. Uh, again, that's kind of I think SARS is very popular, uh, and and regular Raman is. And that kind of more of extension of the fact that you choose a material which has a nonlinear coefficient. So material get excited not by the fundamental laser light, but a, a, a second order or third order light you, you generate inside. Again, applications all kinds of organic uh, species, uh, biological samples. Um, um, you can do a lot of quantitative analysis of clusters and uh, many kinds of spectral thing you can um, um, do. Uh, compounds um, and you can create a fingerprint, very unique fingerprint of molecules uh, as like this very unique fingerprint of graphene. It doesn't match with any other uh, other materials. So you can create molecular fingerprint um, based on uh, Raman. So lots of wide application, um, lots of biological and, 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 uh, and sample people use um, uh, to excite with Raman. Uh, and then find out st protein structure, uh, protein, protein folding effect people monitor uh, because of the studying of the polarization state change. You can understand how protein fold and unfold. So lots of studies people do um, with um, kind of Raman. So any question about Raman before we go to the another different kind of spectroscopy? So, so far we <coughs> kind of looked into UVV spectroscopy, uh, Fourier transform spectroscopy and just now we are just kind of going through the um, Raman spectroscopy basics of it. But we kind of neglected the fact that many times time also plays a role means when you are measuring. So, we neglected the time part it completely, we are just averaging right, Fourier transform, autocorrelation, they are all averaging process, photo detector works on averaging process of many photons, it adds them up. But many uh, instances we will see that we need to know time evolution. So, so spatial, like a spatial means the location and temporal. So how the things evolve as a function of time is also important. So that's something brought us back to some pump probe based spectroscopy. So kind of this is kind of time scale kind of sometime we need to know how quickly we blink, how quickly we can do so, how quickly a day's event happens, cloud comes in, rains comes in, suns rise, sun sets. Um, uh, so, so what I am trying to say here that to measure an event, one needs another comparable or shorter event. To measure your blinking of eye, you need to have a way to click it faster than you can blink your eye. Same way, you need a clock which can thus measure the change of say day's event much faster. So you need a shorter event to capture something you are measuring. So what is saying that we need to have a uh, probe which is actually should be shorter in time scale because you are trying to capture a time using some technique. So that event has to be shorter than your actual event you want to monitor. This is one event. I want to capture how quickly she blinks her eye. I need to have a clock which I can press quicker than her blinking of eyes. That's kind of basic. Uh, and, and typically, scientifically, we are interested into a time scale which are really small. We are looking at a picosecond time scale for say molecular rotation, molecule rotates at a pico, picosecond time scale. Carrier diffuse, you create some carrier in a, in a semiconductor or some kind of material, uh, they actually diffuse or carrier diffusion times in the femtosecond time scale happens and um, uh, or some kind of electronic motion. Uh, happens in attosecond time scale like this motion is attosecond time scale. So now the question is if I have to capture a molecular rotation I need to have a measure less than picosecond means I need a femtosecond to measure a femtosecond pulse or femtosecond events to capture a picosecond. Uh, with, if you want to capture an attosecond you need a sub attosecond phenomena to capture it otherwise it is much faster um, and you cannot capture it. So that's the kind of thing we are looking at. We need to have a faster mechanism and that's something shows that if that is your event, to capture that event you need a pulse 
or a, an your event measuring tool which is shorter right like a, you need to like a, when you cut something you need a different size of scissor you cannot cut a, a small thing with a big uh, scissor same thing you need a much shorter uh, event in this case a pulse to measure a longer pulse that's the kind of need and kind of brought us back to various kinds of picosecond femtosecond and also attosecond uh, laser so that's something it looked like a, a very um, setup um, a pump probe setup so you are pumping a, that is a phenomena you want to that's the blinking of your eye you are actually blinking your eye with some time scale that's a sample you send the pump with some defined um, uh, same pulse width and you generate some phenomena so in this case you generate some carrier say for instance you create some electrons on the surface now after some delay that delay is a controllable delay you send a probe beam so now probe beam will go see that electrons are present so the presence of the electron actually so can be measured uh, so that's your pump beam you actually create this pump and your probe beam uh, comes with an angle and they see the presence of electrons. The presence of electron will change the reflectivity, right? As soon as you have a more electron, your reflectivity goes high or low uh, uh, based on that characteristic of surface, typically go high. So you can create that, uh, so you measure delta R by R. So without pump, whatever R it is, now in presence of a pump, you have some delta R. So you are measuring that as a function of time delay. So, because your carrier actually bounces the photon off, so basically you are measuring. So, other otherwise, I cannot directly measure how many carrier I am generating through my pumping process. But my probe kind of looking those probe came and gone. So, probe came gone. There's no more. I am delaying. I put a delay that the probe doesn't. The delay is longer than your probe width. So, probe pulses disappear no more. But carriers are still there and they're decaying. So, you generate a carrier uh, and let it decay. So if you look through a pump probe, like a, uh, your, you have this setup at time t equal to t0, your pulse came, your pump pulse came and you start suddenly generating a carrier, go high, maximum goes here and then slowly go down and then pump no more, gone, but you still have carriers are still there and they are slowly now dying down. So my, our goal in this case to understand this phenomena. So now my pump is gone, what I'll do, I bring a probe pulse, another shorter pulse I'm bringing so that I, when this probe now, I'm just keep doing this pulsing and, and we're measuring the change of reflection of the probe as a function of say time that will also have similar characteristics because presence of electrons uh, will change the reflectivity from that surface, right? So a presence of those extra electrons changes the reflectivity because that's the nature because um, electrons scatter more photons. So you are actually measuring because otherwise I have no direct way of measuring this carrier decay time. So this is correlated with the same carrier decay time. So I can kind of way to find out carrier decay. So that's kind of the basic principle. So it can be in a reflection scheme that you are reflecting because your substrate has no transmission then you are looking to the reflection or if you are transparent sub substrate you can actually or sam transparent sample or you can measure uh, tra change of transmission delta T by T that's your uh, ratio you can you are measuring so that's your changing how the transmission of the probe beam changes the function of time that you will be kind of measuring so so fourth step uh, pump laser pulse hit on the sample and excite say in this case plasmon or electrons uh, generating say hot carrier uh, we are trying to understand when you excite with a um, uh, pump pulse, how, how when you carry uh, the hot carry electrons you generate we want to understand this decay and then uh, probe laser pulse after a delay of delta T after a certain time your pulse gone and then your probe comes back there will be a difference in the reflection so it comes at a, after some delay and there will be a difference in reflection uh, delta R or absorption between without pump excitation so basically there will be change of R 
bef without pump. Basically, you don't have pump. The what is the reflectivity you measure, and you just normalize that thing. And then actually, you can do that as a function of space uh, and find out the diffusion uh, uh, as a time and also over the space. You can scan the pump so because your your carrier diffusing not on time decaying and also spreading out. So you do sc raster scan because your pulse is much shorter time. Shorter pulse, you can actually raster scan and try to find out who is decaying as a time and how it is spreading as a space. It's spreading, right? It's spreading over a large area. Uh, so you can actually do all of those. So that's what you can actually do. So you, uh, that's the time at uh, minus two picosecond. Your substrate is nothing. Then you at at at. Uh, so that's your no excitation at time t equal to delta t equal to less than zero your reflectivity, delta reflectivity is zero, your probe probes saying no change in reflectivity. Now at time delta t more than zero, you actually um, uh, excite the carriers and that changes your um, uh, re reflectivity um, uh, and then you kind of, and then after a long delay and then you just eventually dies down, right? So you can, you can see that no, no change in uh, uh, reflectivity that is delta r by r when and then you bring your pump you create those hot carriers so reflectivity changes is a big change actually you change and and over time they diffuse they spread out so eventually so that is your delta t equal to um, uh, 0 picosecond that's how your pump cream maximum change of reflectivity that's your maximum carrier concentration and after 10 picoseconds your carrier now spreading and dying and you can see that eventually it kind of go from here to here with about 10 to the power minus 5 change of reflectivity so that's your delta r by r ratio so change of reflectivity we are looking at so that's a very small number. The point we are trying to say, okay, now uh, we have a phenomena uh, is a very short in time, which we are kind of overcoming using a short pulses, but now is also short in change. It's very small change, 10 to the minus five. So how do you measure that small change? That's kind of interesting part of it. Uh, so that's what we'll go. Again, this is very simple reflection measurement or transmission measurement. So your change of reflection, actually you can do, this is your, change of reflection in presence of hot carrier with respect to the background when there is no pump. So you measure the reflectivity before and after. That is after. So and this is the before without the pump. And then you just kind of find out delta R by R, which is very common. This delta R, this is your R, which is without the pump. And then you can model that very well the, because of the Fresnel equation. So we know the uh, electron density, uh, refractive index, all those numbers you can plug in, so you can model that kind of reasonably well. And then the point is that that in that model we are actually plugging in refractive indices, so refractive indices uh, before and after. So refractive index or uh, permittivity changes because of the presence of electron concentration. So point here that we are actually the rate of relaxation of electron actually changes your plasma frequency. Uh, so this is a simply a Drude, Drude model, so you can actually find out based on those fitting parameters, you can based on this fitting delta R you measure and you now plug it back to your delta R calculation based on Fresnel equation and from that you can recalculate back what the N and from the N you find out permittivity which is square root of N and then you can from that we know uh, those parameters are all when known plasma frequency is well known only that scattering parameter which is this this is changing so you can actually estimate uh, your this electron electron and electron photon scattering and relaxation processes so point is that you can if you can measure that um, time dissolved delta by r change uh, a carrier uh, then you can actually find out your carrier information from that thingy but now the next step is that how to measure even such a small change. That's the bigger problem. So what uh, people do that in a pump probe setups, they excite with a uh, pump. And typically they use uh, same uh, many times same same laser as a pump and probe with just a delay in between. So because you excite, this is your cause and your your effect you are measuring through this probe. So typically you use a beam splitter and use same laser with some delay line. So we just send one through a delay, a delay stage, uh, pump and probe come with different delay uh, and then you put a chopper in it. So basically what, what you are saying because your detector cannot really measure this 10 to the power minus 5 change of 
reflectance can change, right? That's the problem. We are measuring this delta r by r, the order of 10 to the power minus 5. So basically, now your detector just summing up. So as a function of time, it sees a very constant, this is a noise floor. So if you don't do anything, it simply looks at a constant noise, at a level of noise. Unless you are much higher intensity, then it knows, okay, this is um, say a signal. But it is simply, it will be at a noise floor, not easy to kind of measure. So what you do, you uh, put a chopper in it and then you modulate. So what you do, your signal, you generate your delta R by R is now delta R only happens as a, as a chopping frequency. So you generate this, you generate this um, at, a, a, at a periodic interval. So you, you chop the signal and then send it back to a lock-in amplifier. So now your signal comes with this frequency and also your chopper frequency, you know, is a fan. You know how, what is the speed of the, of the fan. So you actually know fan's frequency. So you know the fan, what sign, what is the frequency of the fan you are rotating. And, and the same frequency, your signal will be generated because it simply blocks the light, right? Your signal, you generate the whole phenomena only happening in a chopped. So basically, only generating when your fan blade is open. So you are, you are generating the whole carrier, all the processes, the carrier generation process have the same frequency as your chopping frequencies. Again, it's very known electrical engineering concept. Uh, again, just to bypass, this is what you are doing. This is your generation. You are generating your signal um, uh, with a frequency of say omega r and you are actually now multiplying your in, in a lock-in amplifier simply taking a reference which is the frequency you are, you are chopping and you simply multiply the signal you just measured. So you measure the signal, uh, whatever signal you just measured through a lock-in amplifier and you simply multiply it by the reference and integrate. That's what it does. And it's a simply simple trigonometry that you rearrange everything and then this is the AC component uh, because it has a T and it's simply sent to a filter, it goes away, and it lives with a DC component, simply this, which is uh, theta r minus theta i, but as a lock-in, because if, if phase is locked, so as soon as it phase locked, uh, because it has a, you are modulating with a sinusoid, whenever the frequency phase matches, you actually, uh, your theta r become theta i, and you generate a voltage. So that is how you use a lock-in amplification process um, to measure very weak signal. It's very standard technique. You just take your, uh, you chop your signal, which is your driving pump. This is your signal. Pump actually drives the, generates the carrier, right? That's what your generation process. Your signal, the, which is your carrier, right? You're measuring your carrier decay. Uh, which is a function of delta R. So that you are modulating with a uh, uh, chopper. So you are now, your whatever signal you generate, which comes back, right, that's your delta R coming back up, but it's chopped. It's not a continuously coming back. It's a chopped with the frequency of the blocking of the light. So it comes, with, comes back to your um, uh, locking amplifier with same frequency, and then locking amplifier knows what is the fan velocity. So it knows it's, uh, frequency too. So it's multiplying um, the signal you generate with its own reference sinusoid. And then you AC component sent through a filter that goes away and then DC component stays. Um, low pass filter removes AC component and then as soon as phase matching happen means your uh, you know what it does it, 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 it moves around the phase of the reference beam because it knows what frequencies it just changes its, its phase from 0 to 2 pi so if you still thinking like what it does so this is it's doing so you create a because your signal you are generating a some kind of uh, uh, this some kind of this right that's your signal delta r you are generating. Now what it is doing, it is, it is multiplying with a uh, sinusoid of same frequency because your generation will be same frequency because it's chopping at the same frequency of your reference beam, right? So now what it does, but phase is not known because your, 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 your sample may have a different phase than this reference. So what is doing, this phase difference delta phi, it will vary from 0 to 180 degree, right? That is my basic 0 to um, uh, pi phase. So it varies 0 to pi 
interface so that it slowly it will what will do it your 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 generation process is like that and it will bring a sine wave and continuously keep moving it the phi so that at a point it will phase lock it at a point it will suddenly see that your it, it, it as soon as a phase match happen you have a maximum amplitude so that is how a lock-in amplifier works it changes the phase dynamically reference phase this is i cannot change this is coming through my all this generation process but i'm changing this one the point the phase uh, because phase can only be zero to pi as soon as the phase matching happens you have a zero phase and you you it is the system has done don't know what is zero phase he's looking for maximize maximum signal so as soon as he maximizes the voltage uh, for zero to pi phase change so that's what the it locks onto so that is a phase is locks onto it's called phase locking that's kind of uh, what um, uh, it does uh, to pick out a signal of that amplitude so i think uh, let's kind of uh, stop uh, now uh, with the questions and then we'll continue the, the last part which is scanning electron spectroscopy which is very important new field coming up to see really nanostructure uh, 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 close to atomic level uh, in optical spectroscopy, which is otherwise not possible to see. So maybe we'll say we'll meet at uh, 2 o'clock around? 2 o'clock? 2 o'clock. Okay. So I think uh, that will be the, just to teaser that our plan will be to do another different kind of spectroscopy using a tip. So tip enhanced uh, spectroscopy to see uh, some very much of sub wavelength structure we'll be seeing. So that's the whole plan. Here to see some of the thing which is you cannot see normal light and normal spectroscopy. That's the plan. So two o'clock maybe uh, if you have no question then uh, we continue the discussion at two o'clock and then today plan is to end uh, with the infrared detector I was mentioning. So today I will kind of quickly summarize that how to detect uh, on graphene uh, infrared photons. So we saw the absorption but we'll end the detection.